So good afternoon, everybody. Thank you, everyone, for being here uh, today uh, with uh, David Andreata. We are from FEM. We would like to discuss about uh, how the advent of like dance time series changed the way we analyze multi-temporal data, and then also present you some of the methodologies that we developed for the monitoring of uh, alpine environment. So. The workshop will be divided mainly in three parts. First, an introduction in which we will try to analyze what happened in the last 10 to 20 years, followed by a methodological presentation of two methods that we developed, and then ending with a discussion on how and why we decided to use, for example, Google Earth Engine for processing, and then to discuss what are the methodological challenges which are associated to the processing of the NSTEM series. So, to start, uh, let's take a step back of like 10, 20 years. So in the past, like accessing data was quite challenging. So this was the average process that luckily I didn't have to do. I was still too young, uh, but you needed to order your image, to pay for your image, and then also a lot of time they would be physically shipped to you. So you, there was no like uh, fast internet connection. Nowadays, that access is much more straightforward. In like 10 lines of code, you can access all the Sentinel-2 data for the Trentino to Adige or whichever, whichever area you, you want. And also that availability changed significantly. Just to have a quick comparison, in 2012 uh, over uh, Bolzano, you would have like uh, 30 Landsat images at the 30 meter resolution. Nowadays, for the same uh, period of time, for one year, you have uh, like 140 images at the meter resolution. So the data availability has increased significantly. So from a methodological point of view, this led to a shift from, let's say, the classical change detection methodologies that we were developing in the past to a more uh, monitoring framework. So this is an interesting paper that I suggest you to read if you are interested. And uh, where it tries to analyze what happens in terms of uh, what was before uh, the NSTEM series, what, has, what happened after. So like, if I remember when I started my PhD in 2015, so not many years ago, but still like almost 10 years ago, I remember that I was getting my hand on two images and then I would spend like one year working only on those two images. Nowadays that is not anymore uh, do, do, done. You basically have uh, always access, you always work with the dance time series. So we shifted from a case in which we, have, we, we had a few images, so we were able to detect mainly only abrupt changes high intensity changes, so changes that affected the spectral signature of the image in a strong way, and uh, we had the transitional changes. So for example, changes that shift the land cover from one class to another. Nowadays, we have many images, so we are in the context of having like, uh, we are able to detect gradual changes, low intensity changes, so changes that are more subtle and so more challenges to detect, and changes that are conditional. So they, they modify the condition of the land cover, but they do not actually change the land cover. So let's look, for example, at uh, three different uh, classes of changes, and let's try to position them on this scale from like abrupt to, to gradual. So if we consider, for example, Windrow, so VIA is a very good example, unfortunately, here in Trentino to Adige. Uh, via uh, Windrows are uh, abrupt changes, they are high, high intensity changes, and they are transitional changes because we shift from forest to non forest areas. Barbital is another good example, unfortunately, for the Trentino to Adige. And in these cases, we have a more gradual change. So it is not, it's not possible to redefine a pre and post event date because you have a, a relatively slow evolution of the phenomena. It is a low intensity or high intensity, probably a bit in the middle event. And it is a conditional change, but also a transitional change if you're doing the longer term because you end up with dead trees and so with no more forest. Similar reasoning can be done with grassland mowing. So it's a very specific case so where farmers cut grassland. This is our abrupt change because you are having one day you have a grass and the other day you have cut grass, but it is a low intensity change and it is a conditional change. And you may actually disagree with this classification, so you may want to move a bit the, the dots around the slide, which is fine because we think that depending on the context, depending on your application, depending on the sem your semantic point of view, you may have a different view on different uh, changes. So 
as you can see now, we are in a more, uh, let's say, complex framework in which we are able to detect more complex changes. For example, what we did, uh, in particular, me and David, we focused on bark beetle and uh, grass and mowing detection. Regarding uh, bark beetle, just a quick introduction. So if you did some uh, probably sightseeing here in Trentino Alto Alge, you may have seen like these beach patches of red trees that have been attacked and uh, killed by bark beetle. For example, in Trentino, uh, in 20, at the end of 2022, the estimate damage was around uh, almost 10,000 hectares. And it is foreseen that the damage may be even higher than those of Vaya. So, Barbito is the new uh, challenge for the forest of not only Trentino, but the entire Alps. And Barbito, from let's say the remote sensing point of view, is a very interesting case because it, uh, it is, uh, let's say, it is not like, for example, for Wintro, in which you have a very distinct uh, shift in thermospectral signature from one state to another. With Bark Beetle, we have a much more gradual uh, dynamic. And so, especially if you want to be reactive to infestation, you cannot detect Bark Beetle only on, at the end of the attacks, but you need to detect in the middle of the attack. Because if you want to detect it at the end, it is relatively easy because it, it, at that point it can be considered a high intensity change because you will really have a strong impact on the, on the trees. But if we want to be more reactive, so if you want to actually detect it and then apply some uh, uh, strategies in the field to mitigate the, the spread of bark beetles, you need to detect it in the middle of the attack. And there, situation, the situation just gets much more complicated because you have a low intensity change uh, so subtle variation of the spectral intensity of the of the images, and so you risk that you are in the condition of having uh, variation of the change that you are trying to detect, which are comparable to the natural variation of the of the trees. So it is not any such monitoring cannot be performed with the classical approach in which you have two images and you compare like the pre-event and post-event image, also because you don't know when the uh, bark beetle is happened, so you don't have actually a pre and post event image, but now you need to exploit the full information contained in the, in the time series. But again, here exploiting just a, a comparison of uh, adjacent images in, in time would not, be, would not be sufficient because you are dealing with change that is so slow and so subtle that you may confound it, you may uh, not you may mix it, let's say, with the changes associated to the natural phenological cycles of the, of the trees. So what you would like to do would be to move on a larger time scale, so to focus on a larger period of time, so to, let's say, to amplify the change of bark beetle with respect to the natural variation, but you still want to preserve all the temporal resolution of the time series. So what we did was to try to compare, to work across uh, years, so to compare different time series across different years by first harmonizing using our classical uh, composite approach. And then instead of looking at the time series as the classical way where you see it as a one dimensional signal, so a one dimensional time series, we organized the time series in a grid like structure in which now uh, you have a different representation, which seems very similar to the first one, but actually allow us to model better the cyclical nature of uh, the phenological cycles. Because like in this case, we have a two way, two direction in which we can analyze the time series. The first one is the vertical one, so which we call the interannual uh, analysis, which allows us to search for changes across the different years. And this strongly simplified the detection with respect to, let's say, the classical approach because we are dealing with a longer time range. So we can apply this, in, this uh, approach not only for, like, say, once every year, but once for, for each month. So to perform the analysis for all the months that we are analyzing in our analysis. And so we can, you can see that by doing this, we are working across different years, but we are still preserving the month by month information. And then we have the other direction that we can analyze, which is the uh, intra-annual analysis, in which we can, uh, again, preserve the temporal resolution, but also search for temporal inconsistencies. Because, for example, we may have a detection in July, which is not present in August. So what's that case? Are we missing something in August, or are we performing a false detection in July? So by analyzing the time series, the time series also in this direction, this allows us to, let's say, reduce the number of missed and especially of false alarms. So at the end, we produce uh, something like that, which is basically a map in which for each pixel, we identify 
the date of detect the date of detection and also the reliability of detection so how likely uh, how reliable our detection was to validate the, the method uh, we were interested not only in the same just an accuracy of detection but also we were really focused on the timeliness of detection because if you want to be reactive to the change you need to try to understand how early you can detect it from uh, from satellite data so we did uh, uh, we selected four study areas in which we did minorly delineated and uh, detected the reference date of detection for each uh, polygon, so it was minorly estimated. And uh, here are the results regarding this, uh, this, uh, this analysis where we showed that basically for uh, three-fourths of the, of the pixel, the time of detection was compatible in, with respect to one, one month uh, range with respect to the, to the reference date. The main issue here is that the reference date of detection was estimated using planet data, so we are still using satellite data. And this opens uh, a really important fact that when you're trying to uh, detect something so subtle and something which has uh, such an evolution, such as Black Beetle, you need very accurate uh, uh, reference data also in terms of timeliness of detection. So the best way would be to have uh, people on the field that track evolution of, uh, of Barbital, but this is not feasible, especially when we try to perform it on, on a large scale. Considering instead the state detection, the classical, more classical detection performances, what we've seen is that we are able to detect mainly the, almost all of the individual attacks, except some of the, of the smaller ones, which are typically below uh, 0.2 hectares. Tend to have a more, let's say, a statistical uh, validation from a more, let's say, to have a more representation of the entire province of Trento, we use a data set uh, which was still created manually using uh, planet time series, in which we try to estimate, let's say, the classical parameter over accuracy, user accuracy, producer accuracy, and most importantly, the, we try to estimate using the, a mix of the reference data set and the methodology, the estimated attacked area, which was uh, 10,000 meters, 10,000 hectares for our method compared to the 9,000 hectares with of the estimate of the province of the, of the forest service of the of the province of Trento, and we think that that overestimation is because during the years of monitoring there was also some clear cuts after VIA to clean up the forest, so all, also those kind of changes were detected by by the proposal method. Then, uh, so to really. Uh, be able to share this result with the forest service of the province of Trento, what we did was to develop a Google Earth Engine app, so that is now being used by in, in, in Trento actually, to uh, generate the maps and then to distribute the maps to the different stations across uh, Trentino. So it's a very straightforward uh, user interface in which you can select the period of uh, detection and then you run the processing and you will get a classical map overlay to the Google Earth Engine visualization in which you have the year of detection, the reliability of detection, and uh, if you click on uh, the patches of, uh, of, our, of, uh, of the color patches, you can see the temporal profiles of the NDVI. And this was added so that if there are some, actually there are some person expert in uh, remote sensing in the province of Trenton, they can use also this additional data of the NDVI without actually needing to, to download the data. So again, this was a case in which uh, Google Earth Engine was the best solution for us just because it was it, it allowed us to really quickly deploy the application and to easily share it with the promise of trend. But obviously we encounter also some limitations that are classical of the of the Google Earth Engine platform. Now I would like to pass the microphone to David Andreata that will talk you to another uh, challenging topic, which is uh, <laughs> grassland moon detection, again also using Sentinel 2 data. Good afternoon to everyone. And yes, the second case study we want to present you is uh, again our time series analysis. And the problem here was, can we detect grassland mowing frequency? So the number of cuts in each meadow in one year. And this is uh, a quite informative trait. You are probably wondering, why do we care about this? but this can be used as a proxy of management intensity and highly uh, managed grassland are associated to fodder production, higher productivity, higher quality and low abandonment risk, whereas uh, 
extensively managed grassland are associated to higher water quality and to higher biodiversity and to higher aesthetic value. For all these reasons, this information with, which is not available uh, because nobody is uh, taking account of uh, mowing dates and mowing frequency. Um, and this information is useful to develop conservation and management policy. So how does a um, time series of managed grassland looks like? We decided to work on this topic because we were work working on phenology and we saw this picture and we said we must do something with this because it's, it's quite interesting once you know that you need this um, mowing frequency map and this for example is a time series of sentinel-2 vegetation indices uh, from april to uh, november and how many cuts do we have here in your opinion The reference dataset informs us that here we have three cuts. So one at the start of October. And in this case, it's quite easy to see this local minimum. But in some cases, it's not so easy. For example, in, in this case, we have at the, in, at the end of the season many local minima. And our reference dataset so does, we only have two, and the third local minimum is probably um, cloudy, unmasked observation. So for all these reasons, we had to develop our own workflow um, to try to increase the, the accuracy of the prediction. Uh, we use Sentinel-2 images, so uh, you all know uh, the temporal resolution is five days and the spatial resolution is 10 meters, and the, the whole workflow was developed and uh, our results were validated in Google Earth Engine and the code is public. Um, the most challenging part was probably to collect the reference data set and we use farmers interview and planet scope imagery and this data set we developed is quite challenging because is the parcels are very small and the management is fragmented and the management intensity ranges from zero to four mowing events per year and the elevation from 400 to 2000 uh, meter above the sea level uh, so um, we have different vegetation type different phenology and so it was quite a challenging data set and our workflow is composed of four phases in the first phase we have cloud masking and vegetation index computing. But as you can see here, at the end of the season, we really, it's not easy to, to disentangle noise and the real signal. So then we apply a running median smoother. And since we are interested only in the biggest change, so, so in mowing event, we then apply a resampling and then we detect mowing event which are defined as local minimum uh, following a sudden drop from previous values and the last uh, phase is a majority analysis to remove the so-called salt and pepper effect and these are our results we tested six different vegetation indices and the, and the ones performing uh, better was the normalized difference infrared index which is um, sensible to um, vegetation moisture and the mean absolute error is quite low is 0 0.07 and on, in the right panel you can see um, the comparison between the uh, accuracy on the optimization data set and uh, the one on the validation data set so of course the error increases but we are still at just uh, one, 0.12, uh, which is quite low. So we were very happy also comparing this workflow with already available method in the literature. And uh, the workflow has some li limitation. 
this was not developed to monitor low intensity grazing. As you can imagine, high intensity grazing is quite si similar to mowing events, so all the vegetation is moved, whereas low intensity grazing is more similar to water stress uh, and to heat stress. We have um, uh, a less uh, binary signal, it's a more uh, gradual change. And uh, one other limitation is that we tested this method on the Alps, but probably, for example, in the Mediterranean region, we should uh, calibrate again the model because the phenology there is, uh, of course, very different. And uh, nowadays, is um, our method is used by um, the public agency of uh, our province. Uh, to check if the farmers uh, really uh, mowed their grasslands uh, since they receive a subsidy for mowing. And we are working with uh, some other um, ecological groups uh, studying the relationship between grassland management intensity and uh, bird communities. And from this first example, um, we can say that um, with this kind of application, we can have more informed and targeted conservation and management measures. Um, yes, this was published in Just Science and Remote Sensing, and the code is uh, available, and the reference data set is available. And this is an example of the code editor um, in Google Earth Engine. And this is one example of the results. So the different color are uh, different uh, mowing frequency. And here we are in Predazzo, which is quite close to Trento in the Fiemme Valley. And in this last uh, part of the presentation, we want to share our experience about platforms and we will ask uh, which is your experience and we hope that we can discuss this a bit. Um, maybe the interesting story here is that I, can, I come from an ecological background, so for me um, Google Earth Engine was uh, the first platform. I never worked on local data before. Uh, and so I started really with Google Earth Engine. And why did I start with Google Earth Engine? Because um, uh, learning JavaScript was not a problem for me because I didn't know Python, so um, it was just uh, a decision uh, to start with JavaScript. And uh, I found nice tutorials and I could visualize my, the, um, the produced map immediately. And then I didn't have to ask to uh, my bosses, how can I pass access to the local computational power of our foundation, uh, which is probably an issue in uh, many institutions. And it's free for academics and no profit organization. Um, it's also easy to develop and to use uh, um, application tools. And we have a huge catalog uh, and in addition to this, we have a community catalog, which increased the number of available um, collections. But we also have many uh, drawbacks. For example, it's not open, and probably learning Python opens more doors than um, learning JavaScript. And we found that uh, Google Earth Engine is not so flexible. For example, you have a very low control of what's happening under the hood, uh, especially about resampling and rescaling. And sometimes uh, some tasks uh, run out of memory at, on Monday, but then they can be processed uh, the day after. And so you never know how will it go? Um, one other problem is that the developed um, application tools are not free for use for everyone, for example, for companies. And uh, here we are with um, the more interactive part where we want to ask for um, your ideas and your experience, especially on time series processes, processing using platform. <laughs> Armando was a test, of course. And the first question is, 
uh, which platform do you use and for which application? For example, in our case, this would be Google Earth Engine, Bark Beetle, or Google Earth Engine mowing detection. You can also write that you don't use Okay, we have someone else using Google Earth Engine for change detection, which is probably quite similar to the mowing detection. Someone who uses Google Earth Engine but just for downloading. Thank you for this long answering. <laughs> okay, we are not many. Maybe probably you can tell us why have you chosen one of these and for which reason. We can start with anonymous one. If you want to share with us. I tested uh, DSV Kio with a free trial service to, to test some to download some data and process in a cloud computing, but only in a free trial service that is not the same in a, a, a private or a paid um, service. Thank you. And then I almost two. Um, yeah, I'm here, Alex from Eurac. Uh, we, we tried many different uh, platforms just for the sake of learning how they work, basically. So deliberately in basically five different, in five different projects, we selected five different platforms to get some experience with all of them and, and see how they work. We avoided mostly Google Earth Engine for exactly the reason that you said. We have zero control what has been done to the data and especially all of these little things like resampling, image pyramid levels and so on. Uh, you don't know exactly what kind of pre-processing has been done to the data. So in all of our projects, we, we prefer to be in full control of this. We know where we start and what exact kind of atmospheric correction with optical data we do, what kind of speckle filtering with star data and on uh, any kind of geocoding, etc. So that's the reason why we avoided Google Earth Engine. Uh, and then maybe one experience that we gained from this is that in none of the platforms, the data sets are complete. So wherever you go, uh, you will find a lot of missing or corrupt data in the archives with different processing versions and different uh, kinds of things that has been done to the data. So highly inconsistent repositories, I would say. Uh, in theory, they should all come from the same Copernicus archive, right? But uh, we, we made the experience that there's not the same data in EODC and Creo Diaz and the Azure Cloud. We, we also looked into the Google Cloud and uh, the things that are on Amazon S3, basically. So no two collections of Sentinel-2 are the same. This is one thing that we learned, which is uh, quite fun. <laughs> Our solution to this was that, we were, for example, for the case of evapotranspiration, which was, by the way, the product that Luca also mentioned in his talk, we started copying together the data together from Creo Diaz uh, and, and EODC to have like one complete data set, let's say, without gaps. And this is then the next step is to actually do, um, that's maybe then again the advantage of using something like GE, uh, this whole cleanup and, and gap filling and so on, that, that's maybe something they've partially done for you. But uh, in, in this case, at least we, we were in, in control in, in what's happening to the data, but it's also should be known that it's a huge overhead 
of, of doing that before you get to the actual analysis. And I think we can do this here because we have a lot of established workflows for this already. But I, I can imagine that for you, if you come to this newly, then it's a huge overhead to, to get started. And then maybe GE is a good solution. Hopefully soon also something like Open Your Platform could be an alternative solution because they are this should also be done for you or also other things like the Euro Data Cube. Um, they hopefully have also a slightly better curated data sets now so that you can go and directly start, especially if you're more want to go into the Python world. There are already a lot of environments set up like Jupyter environment. There are lots of pre-installed libraries and, and environments where you can just start working if you want to work also on the Pangeo stack of tools or something like this, maybe something to look into. Thank you. Yeah, maybe one comment to um, directly to, to Alex. Uh, there's not no such thing as a static archive. Um, even ESA changes the archive yeah. continuously. Also in the past without notifying anyone, even sometimes without really addressing this in the file. Sometimes you have to really do a, a bitwise comparison to see that the same file is still named the same with the same processing version, still a different file. So there's no such thing as the archive. And talking about reproducibility, if you redo things you've done one year ago, there's likely things that may not be the same anymore. But that's a known issue somehow with these huge data masses. It's not static. So, and uh, you know, your data cube basically, Synergy 2 is created by Synergize on AWS, and they invest quite a lot in exactly doing this on a daily basis, automated. But it's it's nothing that that is easy or so. So that I think that that will be the reality that you have different archives of different versions and reproducibility between platforms will be difficult to achieve, I guess. No, that's definitely the case. I mean, my, my request would mainly be that every platform has something which like is happening on the Euro Data Cube. You need to have someone who is actively curating the data set because uh, if you don't do this, if you just download from automatically from Copernicus and you see in, in your probably script, oh, this scene has already been downloaded. I don't need to take care about this. It's simply not true. You need to have consistent checks on the checksums on, as you said, the bit uh, comparison and so on. And, and these things are not static. It's a moving target of course um, but when when we go into interoperability and going from different places you can really see that uh, they are very different and um, when you compare results it's also something which we learned by the way in the end of the OpenEO project where we try to validate our processes in, in different platforms and all of them gave different results but not because the implementation of the actual mathematical formulas was wrong, but in the end we came that the main reason was that indeed what was the analysis ready data was different in every platform and because of your data base that you have, uh, then you get different results basically because some of them throw out all the images which have cloud cover above a certain degree and then already your time series profile changes and yeah, these kind of things. Thank you very much. I think we can move to the second question, um, which is what are the methodological challenges for your application? For example, here we mean for Bark Beetle, one issue was that the classes were very unbalanced, or that the noise to signal ratio was quite um, high. Um, so yes, and what's in your application? Don't be shy.
Yes, also in my case of grassland mowing, the biggest issue was reference data set because we have now I think 20 papers about grassland mowing detection, but no one of them uh, provide the reference data set. Yeah, in my case, like for Barbito, I think this is one of the biggest in which they can transition from like dealing with a couple of images to like time series of images has impacted the way you, you validate the data. So once you would have like your two images where you have a pre and post event, and now instead you're interested in trying to understand what is the timeliness of the detection. So having like trying having to say that okay, here I have a finished barbital attack, so the situation is stable is not enough. So you what, what you will need actually is to have a monthly update of your reference data, which is basically almost impossible for a basically cost reason. And also another factor is that a lot of the time the data that are uh, submitted to us by the promise of Trento or probably similar case here in, uh, in Bolzano is that they are made by uh, people of the forest service for themselves. So they're not done by having in mind the specific uh, need of the remote sensing community. So converting the data from the, from their point of view to our point of view requires even more work than would be to generate them from, from scratch. But it seems that, yeah, uh, validation data is the main issue from, from methodological point of view. And if I can add another part is that like something that may seem trivial is like clouds, like again, once you, uh, in the past, you will get your two images, which are completely cloud free. They were complete because you will select cloud will be seen just as a technicalities, but now these clouds are really methodological problem which affects the performance, but also again also the timeliness of detection. So it's an interesting research question to try to understand how clouds in different areas impact how quickly you can uh, uh, identify the, the phenomena that you are term monitoring. And thank you for your answer and yes, validation data uh, looks like the most common problem. And the last question is, what are the data limitations for your application? Um, for example, here in uh, referring to mowing frequency, um, of course, the um, uh, temporal resolution is a key because with daily temporal resolution, uh, you can see the mowing event much better. Uh, but, for example, with PlanetScope, um, it's not easy to have good time series. Probably many of you um, face this situation because the, the spectral calibration, the general referencing, um, it's not perfect many times. So, yes, it's a trade-off and Sentinel-2 data is freely available, so we decided to use them, but anyway, higher temporal resolution would be the key for our application because 10 meter resolution is enough for mowing detection. Okay, here again, I would like to ask you to comment your answer, if you want. I mean, there are many different applications uh, and, and many gaps there. Temporal resolution, as you just said, is, is one of them uh, with, with all the, let's say, high to very high resolution data sets, apart from some like Planet, like you mentioned, where you have then, however, a drawback in the radiometric resolution, so to say, the number of bands of good quality that are available to you. Um, parametric SAR, full parametric SAR is only available very sparsely, just a few satellite missions that they have, they're, they're not flying so often. Uh, also again, since Sentinel-1D uh, died, the, even the Sentinel-1 data is only every 12 days available, which for vegetation applications is already quite a reduction in availability, so that's an issue. Um, there are also other things, again, for vegetation monitoring with, with respect to SAR data, multi-frequency SAR would be interesting. Um, and um, also for evapotranspiration, having higher uh, resolution surface temperature would be something interesting.
Thank you. So something that I mean, I mean, the Sahara and gestational is really funny for someone who studied the SAR. And but like something I would like to add, when I was in IGARS, I was discussing with uh, a guy from ISA, which is working on Sentinel-2 uh, next generation. And so they are collecting uh, uh, preferences from users. And it seems like that everyone is asking for both having like higher spatial and higher <laughs> temporal resolution, which may not be possible, or if possible, will require a lot of, let's say, trade-off on other uh, Part. And if I would, if I would ask you, like, would you prefer to have a higher temporal resolution or higher spatial resolution? If you have to choose between the two, what would be the temporal? Temporal, temporal. okay. Temporal. temporal. It depends on the context. For instance, I'm working on Sorelogia, and now we are teaching with feature detection, maybe for crop uh, markings, and for that I don't need the temporal resolution. Okay. Sure. And another thing that I see is that no one is asking for a higher number of spectral channels or a higher spectral resolution. So it seems that also that is maybe not uh, one of the main desire. But yeah, I, like for in my case, like probably. I would go for a, a temporal solution, just because when you're doing with, dealing with forestry, you may not need to go very much into the detail, except if you want to go at a single tree level. But yeah, that really, as you say, depends on the on the application. But it would be fun to see how they manage to have both, because it seems that they are pushing, like the European Union is really pushing to have like five meter. But yeah, let's see. Depends on the pushing. It's coming, so yeah. Do you agree with it? Well, <coughs> that, that, that's, that's a difficult question. I mean, I think it's, it's well understood that increasing spatial resolution will, will allow to identify features in a, in, 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 and more detail that is relevant to, to many applications. I'm still skeptic that we yet make use of the full resolution of even the Sentinel-2, because as long as people uh, uh, resample the data twice and still get what they want, they obviously don't really need the 10 meters, because at that point you are rather at 20. So uh, there is certainly, I think, currently not enough care taken to really preserve what is in the data. So if we now go to 5 meters just to then waste it by, by resampling it three times to, to get it into the right data cube, then I'm not sure that was really, that was really the, the let's say original desire, but it was just more is better. And, and uh, that alone, I think, is not the case. By the way, when you should be saying more spectral channel, we're not, we're not requ really requested here. I think that is simply because there is not enough experience with that. If you would see what you can take out of, of, a, of a, an imaging spectrometer of high quality, that brings that gets your data regularly at 30 meter resolution. I think you would probably, or many in this room, would change their their opinion, especially when it comes to things like grassland, or and 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 species richness and and forest uh, degradation, because that's where this stuff really excels. So, well, generally, I, I think I, I would not would not worry. You will get all of what is on this list within the next five to ten years, and more of it, more than you can imagine. Get better get prepared that you really make use out of it. That's, that's currently the big challenge. That's my message. Yeah, yeah, I totally agree on the fact that we are probably underusing the data. Like forestry, like if you look at the, maybe at the more forest oriented papers, so people coming from the forestry community, at the end, they end up using only maybe one or two spectral index. So, and a lot of time you really miss what you could do by just adding other spectral channels. So I, I, completely, I completely agree. We thank you for your thoughts and the discussion. And I think we can join the coffee break. And if you have any questions, we are here. Just. Yes.